Um, good to see you all. <clears throat> All right. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Peter Strong. I'm co-owner and director of Racing Magpie. On behalf of our entire team, I want to welcome everyone to an exciting presentation that's part of our new program called this winter called Winter Camp. Today, we're with Deborah Bordeaux and Christopher G. Bordeaux, who are presenting their talk called Arts in Schools, uh, More Important Than Academics. Uh, this is a uh, they'll be doing two presentations, one today and one next Saturday at noon as well. Hope you can come back for that. Uh, at Racing Magpie, we're dedicated to elevating and amplifying Native and other artists in their communities through educational, cultural, and research programs, all in the Lakota spirit of being a good relative. As part of that being good a good relative, this program will reimagine the Lakota winter camp model of problem solving and community building in today's world by examining the deeper reasons why Lakota people do things the way they do and why they interact with the universe around them the way they do. These events are free to the public um, and uh, they're gonna target Lakota community members as both presenters and attendees. As plants and trees focus their energy on building strength and growing from the roots during the winter, our community will join to strengthen and grow together each year through sharing and learning. We do want to uh, thank our sponsors for their generous support for this program. The South Dakota Humanities Council, which is an affiliate of the National Endowment for Humanities, the National Endowment of the, for the Humanities themselves with a direct grant and the Bush Foundation. Um, without any more delay, I'd like to introduce Gonessa Ashego Lee, one of my colleagues here at Racing Magpie, to introduce the Bordeaux. Thank you, dear Peter. As Peter said, my name is Gonessa. I use they, she pronouns, and I'm an Iranian here in occupied Ochetisha Cohen territory. Um, as a former classroom teacher and an educator, I'm so very excited for today's event. Um, as always, please care for yourself in all the ways that you need with your camera on or off um, as feels good to you, meeting your body's needs for food and drink. Uh, specifically today, questions are going to be answered all the way at the end of the presentation. Um, feel free to drop your questions in the chat as they come up to you and we'll go back to them um, and make sure that they get answered or, or you can hold them all the way until the end. Um, I'm excited to introduce Mr. and Mrs. Bordeaux. Deborah Bordeaux is currently the Executive Director for the Commission for Ochatisha Koi Accreditation, the only tribally approved accrediting agency. Deborah works to develop and promote Native education with a focus on Native language and culture to be included and the primary curriculum for Native children. Deborah is a graduate graduate of Oglala Lakota College with a Bachelor of Science degree and received her master's degree in education leadership from South Dakota State University and Sinte Gleshka University. Her pre um, previous to her bachelor's degree had a nursing degree as an L LPN from United Tribes Educational Center. Deborah has worked in the capacity of a teacher aide, special education teacher, and elementary principal. Deborah has 35 plus years of experience working in tribal controlled grant schools. During this time, Deborah worked with a local parent group to get a federal law passed for tribal education departments, has developed and delivered testimony to congressional leaders and staff on Indian education, developed and implemented budgets 
policies and procedures and developed relationship with educators. She has also helped develop and implemented a tribal accrediting process with all appropriate approvals and acceptance. She has been married for 47 years, has four children and four grandchildren. Deb and Chris have their master's degrees. All four children have their bachelor's degrees. Two have their master's degrees and are currently working on their PhDs. One grandchild has a bachelor's degree, becoming the fourth generation in Deborah's lineage to have a college degree. Deborah's great grandfather, Pute, always encouraged education. Christopher G. Bordeaux, married to Miss Deborah, and uh, lives in Slim Buttes Lofer Camp community on the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation. He is an enrolled member of the Rosebud Sioux Tribe. Chris is the executive director of the Ocheti Shakoni Education Consortium, a retired gifted and talented educator and principal. Chris has an MS in education admin from Oglala Lakota College, a BS in, eleme in elementary education from Black Hill State College, and an endorsement in gifted education from the University of South Dakota. The majority of his teaching career was in gifted education in tribal schools. Chris has served eight terms on the South Dakota Indian Education Board and three terms on the National Indian Education Association Board. He is currently a board member of the South Dakota Parent Connection Board, the Pine Ridge Girls School Board, and he is a consultant for tribal schools. Without further ado, I'll hand it over to dear Mr. and Mrs. Bordeaux. Forgot to un unmute as always. Uh, it's good to be here. Uh, what you're going to be watching is my the presentation I made uh, for the National Indian Education Association virtual uh, convention that was held in October, and uh, I think it you know it it's it would be easier to watch that you know because I had it scripted and. Um, I'll, it'll be the same thing I'll be doing now if it was live, but I think the recorded one is, um, will be worthwhile watching and of course available for questions after. Debbie? Uh, good morning. I just wanted to, uh, encourage everyone to have an open mind in, in going watching Chris's presentation. I saw a quote this morning on Facebook by a young lady of the name of Dusty Nelson that I thought was really applicable to now. And she said, oppression, oppressive educational systems are key to our liberation. And so um, the kind of education system we have now is a very oppressive education system. So what we offer is the opportunity to look at um, other opportunities. So I encourage you to keep your keep an open mind as you watch this and as we go through our presentations. Thank you. Just want to remind everybody Stay safe, wear a mask. Welcome to the 2020 NIA Virtual Convention. Can you see our Takoja responding to Ina or Unchi on their first day home from kindergarten? The next slide after this is a link to a video I watched about nine years ago. It's somewhat dated, but it still holds true today. Please enjoy.
every country on earth at the moment is reforming public education. There are two reasons for it. The first of them is economic. People are trying to work out how do we educate our children to take their place in the economies of the 21st century? How do we do that? Given that we can't anticipate what the economy will look like at the end of next week, as the recent turmoil is demonstrating. How do we do that? The second, though, is cultural. Every country on Earth, on Earth is trying to figure out how do we educate our children so they have a sense of cultural identity and so that we can pass on the cultural genes of our communities while being part of the process of globalization. How do we square that circle? The problem is they're trying to meet the future by doing what they did in the past. And on the way, they're alienating millions of kids who don't see any purpose in going to school. When we went to school, we were kept there with a story, which is if you worked hard and did well and got a college degree, you would have a job. Our kids don't believe that. And they're right not to, by the way. You're better having a degree than not, but it's not a guarantee anymore. And particularly not if the route to it marginalizes most of the things that you think are important about yourself. Some people say we have to raise standards as if this is a breakthrough. You know, like, really? Yes, I, we should. Why would you lower them? You know, I, mean, I, I haven't come across an argument that persuades me of lowering them. But raising them, of course we should raise them. The problem is that the current system of education was designed and conceived and structured for a different age. It was conceived in the intellectual culture of the Enlightenment and in the economic circumstances of the Industrial Revolution. Before the middle of the 19th century, there were no systems of public education. Not really. I mean, you could get educated by Jesuits, you know, if, if you had the money. But public education paid for from taxation, compulsory to everybody and free at the point of delivery. That was a revolutionary idea. And many people objected to it. They said it's not possible for many street kids, working class children to benefit from public education. They're incapable of learning to read and write. And why are we spending time on this? So there's also built into it a whole series of um, assumptions about social structure and capacity. It was driven by an economic imperative of the time, but running right through it um, was an intellectual model of the mind, which was essentially the enlightenment view of intelligence. That real intelligence consists in this capacity for a certain type of deductive reasoning and a knowledge of the classics originally, what we come to think of as academic ability. And this is deep in the gene pool of public education, that there are really two types of people, academic and non-academic, smart people and non-smart people. And the consequence of that is that many brilliant people think they're not, because they've been judged against this particular view of the mind. So we have a, a twin pillars, economic and intellectual. And my view is that this model has caused chaos in many people's lives. It's been great for some, there have been people who have benefited wonderfully from it, but most people have not. Instead, they suffer this. This is the modern epidemic, and it's as misplaced and it's as fictitious. This is the plague of ADHD. Now, this is a map of the instance of ADHD in America or prescriptions for ADHD. Don't mistake me here. I don't mean to say there is no such thing as attention deficit disorder. I'm not qualified to say if there is such a thing. I know that a great majority of psychologists and, and pediatricians think there is such a thing, but it's still a matter of, dis of debate. What I do know for a fact is it's not an epidemic. These kids are being medicated as routinely as we had our tonsils taken out. And on the same whimsical basis, and for the same reason, medical fashion, our children are living in the most intensely stimulating period in the history of the earth. They're being besieged with information and calls for their attention from every platform, computers, from iPhones, from advertising audience, from hundreds of television channels. And we're penalizing them now for getting distracted. From what? You know, boring stuff <laughs> at school for the most part. It seems to me it's not a coincidence totally that the instance of ADHD has risen in parallel with the growth of standardized testing. Now, these kids are being given Ritalin and Adderall and all manner of things, often quite dangerous drugs, to get them focused and calm them down. But according to this, attention deficit disorder 
increases as you travel east across the country. People start losing interest in Oklahoma. <laughs> They can hardly think straight in Arkansas. And by the time they get to Washington, they've lost it completely. And there are separate reasons for that, I believe. It's a fictitious epidemic. If you think of it, the arts, and I don't say this exclusively the arts, I think it's also true of science and of maths. But let me, I say about the arts particularly because they are the victims of this mentality currently, particularly. The arts, especially address the idea of aesthetic experience. An aesthetic experience is one in which your senses are operating at their peak. When you're present in the current moment, when you're resonating with the excitement of this thing that you're experiencing, when you are fully alive. And anesthetic is when you shut your senses off and deaden yourself to what's happening. And a lot of these drugs are that. We're getting our children for education by anesthetizing them. And I think we should be doing the exact opposite. We shouldn't be putting them asleep. We should be waking them up to what they have inside of themselves. But the model we have is this. It's, I believe we have a system of education that is modeled on the interests of industrialism and in the image of it. I'll give you a couple of examples. Uh, schools are still pretty much organized on factory lines, so ringing bells, separate facilities. Uh, specialized into separate subjects. Um, we still educate children by batches. You know, we put them through the system by age group. Why do we do that? You know, why is there this assumption that the most important thing kids have in common is how old they are? You know, it's like the most important thing about them is their date of manufacture. I mean, well, I know kids who are much better than other kids at the same age in different disciplines, you know, or at different times of the day or better in smaller groups than in large groups, or sometimes they want to be on their own. If you're interested in the model of learning, you don't start from this production line mentality. These are, it's essentially about conformity, and increasingly it's about that as you look at the growth of standardized testing and standardized curricula. And it's about standardization. I believe we've got to go in the exact opposite direction. That's what I mean about changing the paradigm. There was a great study done recently of divergent thinking, published a couple of years ago. Divergent thinking isn't the same thing as creativity. I define creativity as the, the process of having original ideas that have value. Divergent thinking isn't a synonym, but it's a, an essential capacity for creativity. It's the ability to see lots of possible answers to a question, lots of possible ways of interpreting a question, uh, to think what Edward de Bono would probably call laterally, uh, to think not just in linear or convergent ways. Uh, to see multiple answers, not one. So, I mean, there are tests for this. I mean, one kind of odd example would be people might be asked to say, how many uses can you think of for a paperclip? Well, those routine questions. Most people might come up with 10 or 15. People who are good at this might come up with 200. And they do that by saying, well, could the paperclip be 200 foot tall and be made out of foam rubber? You know, like, does it have to be a paperclip as we know it, Jim? You know. Um, now, the test for this, and they gave them to 1,500 people it was in a book called Breakpoint and Beyond. And on the protocol of the test, if you scored above a certain level, you'd be considered to be a genius at divergent thinking. Okay? So my question to you is, what percentage of the people tested, of the 1,500, scored at genius level for divergent thinking? Now, you need to know one more thing about them. These were kindergarten children. So what do you think? What percentage at genius level? 80. 80, okay. 98 percent. Now, the thing about this was it was a longitudinal study. So they retested the same children five years later, age of eight to ten. What do you think? 50. They retested them again five years later, ages uh, 13 to 15. You can see a trend here, can't you? <laughs> now, this tells an interesting story, because you could have imagined it going the other way, couldn't you? You start off not being very good, but you get better as you get older. But this shows two things. One is, we all have this capacity. And two, it mostly deteriorates. Now, a lot of things have happened to these kids as they've grown up. A lot. But one of the most important things that happened to them, I'm convinced, is that by now, they've become educated. They, you know, they've spent 10 years at school being told there's one answer, it's at the back. And don't look. 
and don't copy because that's cheating. I mean, outside schools, that's called collaboration. No, but inside schools. Now, this isn't because teachers want it this way. It's just because it happens that way. Um, it's because it's in the gene pool of education. We have to think definitely about human capacity. We have to get over this old conception of academic, non-academic, abstract, theoretical, vocational, uh, and see it for what it is, um, a myth. Uh, secondly, we have to recognize that most great learning happens in groups. The collaboration is the stuff of growth. If we atomize people and separate them and judge them separately, we form a kind of disjunction between them and their natural learning environment. And thirdly, it's crucially about the culture of our institutions, the habits of the institution and the habitats that they occupy. I think that video uh, says a lot about education, how education is and has been failing our children. These are really good words um, to say every day and remember forever. Before a child talks, they sing. Before they write, they draw. As soon as they stand, they dance. And this, this expression or this saying, art is fundamental to human expression. This is the title of my presentation. If they haven't introduced me, I'm Chris, Christopher Bordeaux, a retired educator, enrolled member of the Rosebud Sioux Tribe. I'm Sichango Lakota. I live in the Lofer Camp community of the Wapamity District of the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation in South Dakota. Former board member of NIA, served a total of three terms as a gifted and talented teacher director for the majority of my career in tribal schools and a principal for the last few years of my career. I'm currently a consultant for tribal schools and all aspects of Indian education, especially native gifted and talented. I'm also the greatest native photographer in the world, but that's another presentation. Please enjoy the following presentation and there'll be time at the end for questions. There's been a growing movement in public education and government circles to cut funding to the arts. Next time you hear someone suggest that art funding is an essential expense, remind them that the nonprofit arts and culture industry drove $166.3 billion of economic activity during 2015. That was five years ago, so it has to be higher. And this is according to the American for Arts, Arts and Economic Propriety Study. Says that all money is what people listen to when they should listen to children. But now during this pandemic, they are starting to listen to children. This is something to think about. There will be a quiz. All, remember, all. Music keeps the mind sharp, serving as a challenging cognitive exercise. It also feeds the soul, develops character and boosts creativity. Music does not discriminate between race, income, or social status. It benefits children equally. Benefits children equally. A new study found a link between arts elective courses in music, dance, visual art, and drama, and better grades in middle school better grades are what's most important to schools. 
Art is an outlet for students to say peacefully and powerfully what needs to be said about human rights. It's ironic when a student painting is found to be intimidating, especially when it's hanging in the very center of political power. Art can be a focal point for civic education, engagement and civic dialogue, even when the subject matter is controversial. Ask yourself, why was this painting so threatening? This painting was done by a friend of mine who included it in a show he did. The curators of the show took the painting down when he left after setting up his show. It is his interpretation of the 32 plus, 38 plus two in Minnesota. He called this Abe's a dick. Why was this painting so threatening? The arts are healing in a nation where rapidly aging population provides an outlet for joy and community building as preserving health and well being. The endowment for the arts notes that older adults who both create art and attend art events reported higher cognitive functioning, lower rates of both hypertension limitation to the physical functioning than did adults who neither created nor attended art. An older adult, an old guy, created this, photo this photograph higher cognitive function. Lauren Martin in her article says, where have the arts in education gone? We've seen the trend of schools cutting the arts from their curriculum, music, art, theater, gone for so many. The arts help children, I don't like the word kids, develop on many fundamental levels. Here are top 10 ways that the arts help children learn and grow. Remember these, please. Creativity seems like a no brainer. The Washington Post says in an art program, your child will be asked to recite a monologue in six different ways. Creating a painting represents a memory or compose a new rhyme to enhance a piece of music. If children have practiced thinking creatively, it will come naturally to them now and in their future. Believe this, I do. Improve academic performance. The arts just help develop a child's creativity. The skills they learn because of them PBS says a report by the American for the Arts states that young people who participate regularly in the arts three hours a day, three days a week, are four times more likely to be recognized for academic achievement and so on. Four times more likely if they participate in art regularly. Motor skills. When younger children do art, playing instruments, hold, like holding a paper, scribbling with a crayon, it helps develop their fine motor skills. Around age three, they should include drawing a circle, beginning to use safety scissors. Around four, children may be able to draw a square and become, begin cutting straight lines with scissors. I never could cut a straight line. This is also true, or this is so true, and it also helps them to learn to stick out their tongue when they're cutting things. Confidence, while mastering a subject builds students' confidence. There's something special about participating in the arts, getting on a stage, singing. 
I knew a, a young lady, a sixth grader, who was taking part in a um, youth conference for um, middle school and high school. And in one of the sessions that I was um, facilitating, they came in and announced this uh, show after and if any a competition if anybody wanted to participate a variety show and one of her friends said you should get in there and, and so I went over to him and during the class and and I said um, are you thinking about it and she said no and she said you should you can really sing you can sing and I said well you might as well try it you know what can happen and uh, then I we went that was in the morning in the afternoon this young lady got up on stage and she sang perfect by uh, what's that guy I remember the guy's name and that whole gym would just went silent she sang that whole thing on her own no backup and then the whole place just exploded when she was done and I think she's out of high school and pursuing pursuing that visual learning one thing that kind of caught my eye in here was sculpting in art class and how it helps you inner you know um interpret criticize use visual information how to make choices based on that and how many sculptures do all of you have from your children or even your own sculptures from your child good all are all our students. The art strengthen problem solving and critical thinking skills to make good decisions, making choices. And in education and other parts of life, this is, uh, you know, art, because you feel good about doing things, you make good decisions. And you, you don't worry about whether you're going to make a mistake or not, because you know you're going to make mistakes. I know from personal experience at the arts, and you could read through this while I'm talking. This is a quote, and it's not from me, because I don't play the clarinet. But reading through this um, about perseverance, I think about children these days in schools who are really not challenged. They're not being challenged in schools. And um, art challenges them, and it's something that they enjoy. And they're just not being challenged in schools. Focus. We always talk about how children aren't focused in the classroom. And just think of how focused children are on all those electronic devices they have and why are they so focused? It's vital for studying. You just have to put those together. I don't like the word collaboration. A long story, but I just don't like it. So I've said cooperation. Children are very social and they want to belong. And they learn about sharing uh, responsibilities. They also learn how important they are. And here it says children learn that their contribution to the group is integral to its success and they don't have to do everything by themselves they don't even have to be the leader they just need to know that they are important 
they're, they learn to be accountable. And if they mess up, they realize it's important to take responsibility. Mistakes are part of life and learning to ex accept them, fix them and move on will serve children well as they grow older. Social beings need to know that mistakes are a part of life. All our students, all. Research from the University of Western Australia suggests that exposure to the arts for two hours every week could drastically improve your mental health and overall well being. It can be active exposure, painting, or passive exposure, just like walking through a, a museum. And I've taken students to the muse to museums and galleries and they are, you, you think they can't handle it, but they can. And to do things over and over again, what it said in the one of the previous slides about practicing, and there's that saying that practice makes perfect. Practice does not make perfect, it makes permanent. Programs that specialize in bringing the arts to underperforming schools, proven that right left brain students really do benefit from arts. This is very, I've seen this happen so many times in schools about what art does for children. I'm, a, I'm part of a board for a girls school in Pine Ridge and their concentration is basically, I guess you could consider it's art, it's the culture, the language, the true facts of who they are. They find out who they are and their test scores show it. But that's not what the priority of the school is. The priority of school is for those girls to know who they are. This just adds to it too. There was a study done and people say, well, where's the documentation? It's right here. There was, there's studies that always are done. Further evidence, schools with art programs do, dead, do better on standardized tests. When I was talking before, I took part in the art therapy in our, in this one school I was in, and it, it's pretty involved. But I remember when I was a, a gifted and talented teacher, probably about 15 or more years ago, um, when the students came over, there were some students missing. They came over for their, uh, for their class with me. And I asked where they were and they said, well, they didn't do their classwork so the teacher won't let them come over. So I had words with the teacher and the teacher, and I told the teacher, send their work with them. So the teacher sent their work with them. And I always did like 20 minutes of work and then five or 10 minutes just to visit and unwind and find out what's going on with them. So this day, I, the next time they came, she sent work over with them, worksheets. So I did the worksheets with them and they all finished them in like five minutes. And I thought, oh no, you know, they're just filling in anything and sent them back. The teacher stopped me after school or came over to see me and told me, you helped them, you filled out those worksheets. And I said, no, I, she said, yes, you did because almost all of them got almost everything right. And I said, I didn't do anything. And she didn't believe me, so I told her, come next time you, with the class. So she did. She got somebody to watch the rest of the students. And I went through what we always do. And when it came time for that, she handed out their worksheets. And again, they all finished them in like five minutes. And then they went about what they were doing. And she sat down and stayed with them the rest of the time. And 
looked at the worksheets. And when it came time to leave, they got up and they were leaving. And she came over to me and she said, how did you do that? And basically it was art. And what art does is it relaxes the creative side of the brain, which handles trauma and children, all children go through trauma and that stops any flow of that synapses to the logical side. But when you do art, it involves that creative side, it opens up that synopsis, synapsis to the logical side and then they just kind of take in all that logic, all that academic stuff. They are gifted, gifted. When I was at WKDS school, uh, we brought this, I brought this poet in from Wyoming to work with the uh, uh, fifth and sixth grade, especially. And so he separated the boys and the girls and he worked, he told them he wanted them to write a poem about love. Of course, they all giggled and everything as they would writing about love. And one child who, he was one of those at-risk troublemakers, so some teachers told me. But this is the poem he wrote about his interpretation of love. Sitting at the kitchen table, looking out the window, watching my grandpa catch a horse for me to ride. Love. If art makes children happy and feel good about themselves, give them a sense of achievement and help them to appreciate beauty, then that is justification in itself. The following is a video of a recent graduate of the Institute of the American Indian Arts. Austin Big Crow Jr. He speaks to the essence of his work. Back into that cycle, I think it's important to get that out there. 
really excited. And watching that video is justification in itself. When non-native programs within Indian communities are well, there's well-documented facts, historical facts caused that have caused a cultural barrier between non-natives and natives in the US, which in turn created a resistance to programs that originate from outside native populations. If schools across the nation or world would concentrate on the arts in schools, children would have a brighter future and not looking out that brighter future from inside a box. There is no box, get rid of it. Children all over the world know that their brains are their own and when they depart on their way, highway of education, but they never see that education is what stifles their brains. The research that is presented, that has been presented here is easily understood and not caught up in data, negative data and figures, expanded English chart percentages, standards, and deficit models of education. Deficit models. This, those last two slides, this is tells just an interpretation of what it is. My report is titled, Dakota Access Pipeline, The Raping of Mother Earth. People with training in the performing arts are motivated to have sustained attention to that particular art form. And it leads to cognitive improvements in other areas of life, including academics. There were two years of study in Houston, 42 elementary and middle schools, 10,000 third and eighth grade students they found that a substantial increase in arts education experience has remarkable impacts on students' academic, social, emotional outcomes. Why don't we do this? Why haven't we been doing this? We need the arts to learn from the past. All of us need to interface with the sights and sounds of another time, another mindset. Here's a video of a, of a doctoral student from UCLA. Clementine Bordeaux speaks on Ella Deloria. I was born and raised on the Pine Ridge Reservation. I'm a Lakota woman. Chante Washte Nafe Chuzafi Clementine Bordeaux Imachiapie. I just introduced myself in my Lakota language. I am Clementine Bordeaux and I'm greeting you with a warm heart. I'm a doctoral student in the World Arts and Culture program at UCLA. I am talking about Ella Deloria who was a Dakota ethnographer from the early 1900s. She became one of the premier ethnographers on the Dakota people, um, which was really important to her because she wanted to be able to create information about her community that was from her community's perspective. Because at the time in anthropology, it was very much salvage anthropology. So anthropologists were just going out and getting whatever they could because they thought all of these cultures were dying in the Americas. But I think Ella Delaria really understood that these stories and these narratives and this culture of hers and her family needed to be preserved in particular ways. And she also had a very large impact on the reawakening of our language. Lakota and Dakota is an oral language. We didn't write things down. We didn't have a orthography. When she was developing shorthand to write down the language, when she was doing interviews or doing participant observations in the field, she based it on a larger linguistic structure, but really tried to cater it to specific sounds in the language. Her work, now that people are coming back to it, because it was kind of forgotten for a while, A, because she's a woman, and because she was Dakota. But now people are coming back to it and realizing that she had created this foundational structure of writing the language down. She's published two manuscripts, Water Lily, which is a fiction about a young Dakota woman transitioning through life, 
from the prairies to the reservation at the time. And her other manuscript is called Speaking of Indians, which is Dakota ethnography. She attempted to try to help people understand that Native people weren't savages, that they had a complex history, they had a complex culture, that there was intellect embedded into everything that was Dakota community. My mom gives the Water Lily book to every eighth grade young woman she knows that graduates from junior high. I know there's a new cover now of Water Lily, but this is the one I got from my mom in eighth grade. And it's a book that I come back and reread, um, and it really has a lot of this foundational information about what it means to be a woman in our culture and also ultimately I think what Ella Deloria writes about is being a good relative. This is from her Speaking of Indians chapter called Kinship Roles in Dakota Life and she says to be a good Dakota then was to be humanized, civilized, and to be civilized was to keep the rules imposed by kinship for achieving civility, good manners, and a sense of responsibility towards every individual dealt with. For me, what really stands out is that like keeping the rules imposed by kinship and a sense of responsibility, uh, because that is not only to other people, but to yourself. So what is the responsibility of making sure you're being a good relative to yourself and keeping yourself healthy so that you're not, you know, implementing that trauma on other people that you might have experienced. And I carry that with me. I mean, I think that really draws me to the work I do in Los Angeles and trying to be a good relative to the Tongva people, trying to be a good relative in all that I do. And so whatever I produce is not only for me, but for the people that are coming after me. And that hopefully in 50 years, there'll be a Lakota scholar who is looking at work that I've done and feels the same that I feel towards Ella Deloria. I was born in, I was. These previous articles and sections of these articles state that Dr. Bruce Mill was a professor of gifted at the University of South Dakota taught. Gifted and talented courses would say about gifted education. And to me, he was probably the greatest professor, professor of gifted education. And one of his mottos was, he'd always say, keep the faith. In these following words, he said about gifted, I followed ever since I took and became a gifted and talented teacher. He said, gifted stuff is good for all students, but is essential, essential for gifted students. Here are all the works I cited. Um, and I think that's the end of this. And I'll uh, stop this, uh, stop my PowerPoint. And I think it, uh, there's gonna be time for questions right now. So everything will stop and thank you for being here and for uh, listening to my presentation. Doksha. Thank you so much, Mr. and Mrs. Bordeaux. Shall we, did you have words that you wanted to offer before we open it up to questions from relatives who are on the call? Uh, those videos, you can find them online real easy if you want to. And then the, somebody had a post about the uh, comics. I think the, the guy's name is Ricardo. What's his last name, Peter? Cote or? Kate, yeah, Cate, C-A-T-E. And he does have a website. So you can just, you know, Google him and, but he does a lot, really a, a lot of good uh, humor, just about life. 
and whenever something comes up, he's always putting something out. So it'd be worthwhile to, to look at his website. I'm Thank thinking you. right now. <laughs> are, are there any questions other than the cartoon one? I'm seeing one come through on Facebook, if you give me a moment. OK. Uh, it says it's from, oh, from Dusty Lee Nelson. Um, Dusty asks, since a lot of families are at home, how do you suggest parents bring art into their homes during this time? Simple to complex ideas? Good question. <laughs> Good question, you know, Dusty. Uh, go ahead, Debbie. No, I was just gonna, I was just drawing from when our, ch our children were young. Uh, particularly around this time, I tried to come up with ideas um, for them to make uh, Christmas gifts for families and have um, materials, try to have materials that they could um, do that were similar and share ideas with each other. Um, that I tried to um, instill in them the idea about being able to to make gifts for family and relatives rather than going out and buying stuff. Um, you know, so that, that's an opportunity with children. The other thing that is oftentimes we don't see as um, teaching a formal, because we, we have this tendency to look at education from a formalized standpoint, you know, just as um, that they have to be learning out of a book, but there's just so many aspects of everyday activities that involve um, doing, watching and doing. And that's, to me, that's the biggest thing that ed, art can provide is that watching and doing, um, teaching them how to make bread or um, how to, um, look for things, uh, scav do a scavenger hunt and look for different, um, you know, like leaves or rocks and then talk about them and tell them, teach them about um, their relationship, um, building that. So in that you're building vocabulary, you're helping them to learn about the function of things. There's just so many different little activities you don't think about as formalized education, but they're just everyday activities that you can do with children and help them learn. Even sitting and doing something on the computer or your uh, phone, whatever device that you use, there are activities there that can help them that lead to reading and spelling and learning how to do those things. Those are practical things I could think of. Go ahead, Chris. All, all of the artists, native artists have websites. And if you uh, just Google them or, you know, find out from like Peter from Racing Magpie or Golnesa, all of the native artists and go to their sites. And a lot of them will have videos posted and some of them, you know, will show you, you know, will have lessons to do art. Another one is, you know, the children are always on their uh, devices or, and to ask them to explain all of that to you. And they could teach you how to do all of those games that they do. And you could see the importance of them once you get into them, the concentration, you know, that I talked about earlier, uh, focusing on things. Um, there, you know, there's so much that, you know, that TV can do, but there's so much that you can not watch it for entertainment, but watch it 
to have your children teach you things. And once they learn how to, I, I think, teach you things, then they get an understanding of it. And always see the humor in whatever's going on. You know, uh, the reason I think humor is so important is um, if you listen to a lot of the really good comedians that make you just laugh and laugh, is they really understand life. They really do a lot of research into what they're making, making you laugh. They're not making fun of things. They're making you laugh about life. And that's why humor is so important. And I think that's why our ancestors had humor is they understood life, you know, as, as deep as you can go with it. And I, I think that's why, you know, why we, why humor is so important in everything we do. And arts are so important because arts are, are just who we are as people. Um, and creating something in art, you know, I, I talked in the presentation about the, you know, the, the sculptures that people did and the handprints that you do, um, building little things out of clay and bringing them home and, you know, and, and we still have them, you know, from our children who are, I, I was going to say old, but I better not. Uh, <laughs> but it's just, the main thing I said, and one of the main things I said in there is that people are starting, finally starting to listen to children and ask children what they want. Explain to them what's going on and, and say, well, what do you think we can do? And man, they'll come up with a lot of things that you can do at home. And, you know, it's like what, what, uh, but Debbie said, what did you say? <laughs> um, I was just going to say, what did I say? <laughs> <laughs> that uh, just working with, with your children, not really working with them, but, you know, having a, a good time with them on what they're doing, you know, what they, what they want to learn. You know, I always encourage teachers to do that. Uh, you know, all the training teachers get, you know, they get hours and days and years of training to deal with everything in the classroom and things aren't, things haven't changed in the classroom, you know, because it's a deficit model of, of learning. It's a deficit model of life, the classroom. And it's, you have to be right in the classroom. And that isn't life, you know, life is, you build on your mistakes. You know, that, that's, uh, you can't be afraid to fail because failing is what builds, you know, they always talk about, um, I think it was whoever invented the, the light bulb. It was like 1,000 or 1,200 and some filaments he used before he discovered one that could stay burning. And, those were all failures. And what if he quit after one, you know, it wouldn't have been, it might've been somebody else, but they're not mistakes, but you know, we learned how to call them mistakes. They're another step. And with children and in schools, they learn that failure is bad. Failure is wrong. And how else do we learn? You know, we, we can't, if we were right all the time, you know, this would be to me a, a very boring life if we were always right, even though I'm always right. Um, but I, you know, in, in coming right down to it is ask the children what, what they want to do during this time. And now, you know, we're, we're gonna have to be staying indoors a lot more. And, but going outside in the cold is very invigorating and uh, there's always something to be to be done and just ask the children they'll tell you and be sure you get a lot of uh, art supplies <laughs> always have those available 
pencils, you know, drawing stuff, crayons, paint. And and not only, uh, but there are things in your home that you can use um, to make things out of. Um, our two grandchildren share, you know, taught us that cardboard and gray tape can make anything, you know, and um, it's accepting what the what they bring forward and say, look what I made for you, you know, and um, uh, acknowledging the um, efforts that they put in there and exhibiting them is really important. You know, and uh, our education system has taught us to look at things from a deficit model. However, we need to acknowledge the things that children bring that um, may look like a gray lump, but really for them, the effort that they put into it to make it look like something presentable to you, acknowledge that and accept it for what it is. It's a beautiful piece of art. And um, so, you know, it's really important to encourage children and um, let them know that you really appreciate the work that they put into whatever it is that they're doing and um, accept it for what it is. In, you know, and even in terms of the electronic devices, again, we had a conversation with one of our grandchildren the other day, and he was showing us his um, iPad and the game he was playing on there. And he's five, six years old. <clears throat> and he was telling us all the names of the planets on there and telling us how they orbit the um, sun and how they orbit and where they go and what they do. And he could tell us the names of all of them, you know? And so that was really exciting to learn those things from him and um, have him tell us about those things, you know? So we, we tend to, we've been taught in education to make silos of everything. Okay, now we're gonna do reading and you bring out a book or now we're gonna do math and you bring out a book. But the, all of these things can be integrated into each other and um, help children learn and um, be free about it. One of the things I also remember is Chris Eaglehawk always talked about and encouraged children at the Techa Wachipi Okola Kichie. And he talked about how important that learning how to dance was, that it's about learning, your, learning yourself in space and not to be running into each other when you're dancing and to be aware of what's going on. And he always talked about that at all the different powwows that we went to. And, you know, so there's, there's always people encouraging and that saying encouraging things to children. And that's what's important and can come out of um, using art. And, and we tend to think of art as a drawing a picture, but it goes beyond that. There's so much more uh, that is part of art. Anyway, any some, other? Yeah, some of the, there were some questions on uh, on the chat. One from Michelle about um, advice for young adults who don't have a art background or degree and want to create or uh, be more artistic or or ha have a habit of creating art. And there's always pressure on what's good art and what art art is worth sharing. Um, to to be, and I think Debbie was just saying that it's what you want and what you see as good art. And you know. Um, the only thing, uh, you know, the pressure on being good art is when you're in a competition and you're doing it uh, basically for a prize or for money, but we create art every day. I mean, everything we do is, is art. When we cook, even when we clean, um, not even, but when we clean, <laughs> cause I'm always cleaning, right? Debbie? Yeah. <laughs> But it, it's just whatever you want to share, you know, your your children, when they come home or a younger um, niece and nephew come home or they want to show you what they've done, you know, and to them, that's worth sharing. 
And if you want to get into, you know, the, the, I guess the art as, you know, like in, in painting and real good painting is there are a lot of people who will teach you how to do that. And it's, it's like anything, I guess, in education is, is a learned behavior. Some people are just born with it. Others, it, you know, it takes a long time to, to develop it. And, and once you develop it and you keep, keep at it, you know, that, that's another way to go is, you know, have, take art lessons. You know, there's a lot of online art lessons right now, a lot. And they're not, some of them are spendy. Most of them are not. People just want to share their art. And I know Native artists, they love sharing their art. They really do and talking about it. And then uh, Alyssa Bonoist, Alyssa, she is one of the best basketball players out of Eagle Butte I've seen in a long time. Anyway, in her day. Hi, Alyssa. She wanted to know how, how to get more uh, support from school administration and for the arts, shift the mindset away from test scores. I, as in it, when I was administrator, what I wanted to see was documentation, research. Show me your research. Where does it say this? Or is this just, you know, because because of something else? And a lot of the things that I said on here that I put on my uh, PowerPoint are documentation. And there's a really a lot of documentation of why art is so important, why art therapy is so important. And it's a secondary thing about art is academics. I don't know how else to say it, but if you show the, the, the uh, research and have documentation and you know go to administration, go to the school board, you know anybody, um, I think that that will start on the road because it, it's going to take a long time to even think about things like that for school administrators. Um, and then uh, there was a comment from Facebook, Facebook about Did, uh, Trisha Withhorn said they did uh, projects for parent gifts. They did beaded necklaces and earrings yesterday. And then somebody, you know, um, uh, Michelle was asking about the, the worth of things. I mean, to those children taking those home, giving them to their parents for Christmas, you know, whether it, their parents are their guardians or their uh, Uchi and Gaka and or whoever, their parents are. Those are worth something. Those are important to them. So, I, you know, um, I'm not sure what, when we look at things that say value, we tend to look at it from an economic standpoint, but those kinds of gifts that children put together for family, there's no there's no dollar amount that could be put on them because of the um, relationship that's involved there. And that's one of the things that research has shown is how important relationships are to helping children learn. So when you have a good relationship with a child, they will work with you uh, because of that relationship, you know. And so to Alyssa's uh, concern about administration, you know, that's one of the things that research has shown is how important it is for children to have a good um, relationship with their teacher or the adults in their school system. And um, that will help them to feel their worth, their self worth and be able to um, exceed in what they're doing. Um, you know, and it's really important to be able to recognize each child for what they can do and um, how, how they can proceed through that. And so, you know, and I was 
thinking about the answer the way that uh, Chris had, what Chris had mentioned about the research that he put into his PowerPoint. There, there was a tremendous amount of uh, research that shows that if you include art in your education system that your test scores do improve. And it's really hard for administrators to see that. Uh, but the more that you put that there with the students, the, the better off in the end uh, they're going to do with their test scores. So, you know, again, coming back to some of the different activities that I did with students in the classroom. Um, when we were in special ed, we would always have a activity at the end of the school year, which involved fishing. Um, and historically, it was an activity that our ancestors did with uh, young children when they're five, six, maybe seven, eight years old, and they'd take them out fishing and teach them about the water and all the plants and animals that were there around the water and then teach them about fishing. Um, and it, there's just so much lessons that can go on that. And then we would have them then let them fish. Of course, it was fun. Uh, they enjoyed it and just had a really good time getting fish hooks. Fortunately, Chris came along and fixed, uh, was sit there all day and fish or fix the fish hooks on the lines for those boys as they fished and then um, then they could take the fish home or put it back in the water. But the, that was an activity that we did that helped them to learn about the different kinds of water that there were. So you, you just have to open your mind up to use these kinds of activities and, and work with them. Another activity that we did with our children um, we, when we were, when they were young and growing up, we didn't have regular TV. We only had um, public TV. And then um, we had videos that we would watch. And so depending on whatever was going on in school and they come back and ask questions, we'd find a video to support it. The one that stands out the most for me right now is the Fiddler on the Roof, because I like that. We were having a discussion about Jews so we used that and watched that video and, and then we talked about it and we had a conversation. And um, so, you know, it's finding practical things like that to, to do with children and to help them learn. Another lesson that I did, it's another one of my favorites is with some students, um, we did a pancake breakfast. So they had to read the recipes and to learn how to read. They had to, um, it, we only made 12 pancakes. They had to figure out how many people they were inviting. So how many pancakes would each person eat? So that, that was an activity that the students had to figure out for themselves. Um, so there's just so many different things uh, that you don't think about uh, as teaching, but they're there. Um, those are things that you could share with your administrator that provide an opportunity for children to see how those skills that they need to know about reading and writing and doing math and doing science, all of that fits within what's happening from an art perspective. Um, it's, it's, your, it's your perception about how you think children should be learning. And if it's always from a book, it's going to limit what they can do. So I just really encourage you to open your mind and think about um, the different things that can happen with children. Um, another example is of my grands, one of my grandsons wanted to uh, make gifts for family members and he found a video on uh, the computer that showed him how to uh, design some gifts which he sat very carefully following every step of the video and making gifts for all of his family members and made sure that everybody had one based on what he was able to um, view on that video. So there's different ways of encouraging your children to do things without um, having to have a whole lot of supplies, but just using things that are in your home. And, uh to maybe add a little couple of the stories about uh, when we'd go out fishing and 
most of the day I'd spend untangling lines. Uh, we had this one boy, um, like Debbie said, we, we gave him the option of keeping the fish or putting them back in the water. And he said, can I take them all home so I could have, you know, for my family? And somebody said, okay, everything we catch, we'll give to you. So when it came time to, to drop him off, he lived up on red shirt table. Um, everybody is saying, do you have a, a bag to carry him in and all of that? And cause there was about, I think six, six, eight fish trout that he had. No, I'm okay. And here he got out here. He had all those fish stuck in all his pockets. He was walking back to his house. <laughs> Still remember that. Yeah. And then uh, in gifted and talented, what I used to do is take children um, up to the Black Hills to all the site, sacred sites up there. We would always uh, end up with a, spend a week in Yellowstone with the um, eighth graders, you know, starting down in third grade, take them overnight because as tough as a lot of those third graders are, you know, they really get lonesome. But we would take them, you know, to all those places, Little Bighorn, um, We'd walk, go up uh, Black Hawk Peak at night, walk up there. And for, I don't know how many summers I used to do those hikes about five times a summer. So I'd always lose about 20 pounds, but I'd gain it back when school started again. Um, and then later on, I would see these same children as grown-ups that had children, and they would always tell me, we save up money and we go to those different places you took us to. We do, we do that for our children because you did that for us. And we was having, having a meeting that uh, WKDS one time brought in the whole community and, and uh, separated, you know, K, K2 and, you know, like everybody does. And one of the things all the kindergarten, first grade parents were saying was, we need, we want things done for our children like Chris did when we were in school here. So it was like, geez, am I that old already? <laughs> but uh, it's just, you just do things for them. And, and uh, one thing I always made these children do is write and keep a journal and write stuff and draw things. The Northern Plains um, Art Market. I think that's when I first start meeting all of these different artists. I would have, when school started, I'd have an art contest, I called it. I'd say the winners will go to the Northern Plains. And there were always about 20 or 25 children would submit art. And it wouldn't matter what, you know, it wasn't a contest, it was just who wanted to take part in art and whatever kind of art I got, whatever they did, they would be, I'd announce them all, here are the winners and I'd name all of them off and take them all up there. And we'd spend the whole weekend, you know, at the Northern Plains, uh, we'd go there when it opened to show them, you know, how it used to be just real crowded. And they would come back later in the afternoon and have them um, interview artists. And that's when I really found out that artists really like to talk about their, their art. And a lot of them found their um, aunties and uncles there, their cousins, they, they said, I didn't know they did that. And a lot of them carried on and, you know, and, and was able to do all of that stuff. And, but it's just, I guess the word is exposing them, giving them the opportunity. Um, but that, you know, they always remember that. They always remember the things we did that they wanted to do. And a lot of it is art. So, Debbie? Yeah, I was just, it, with those, there's different other kinds of lessons that come with that when you take children and give them the opportunity to experience uh, a different setting other than um, where they are at their school. 
one of the things that we would do is um, put in a request to the administration for a dollar amount per child to take them on a trip, field trip to uh, Rapid City and go to a, a restaurant. So that fortunately, there was a couple of restaurants in Rapid City that were willing to share their menu that um, I was able to bring back and show to the students so they could look at it, learn how to read it, um, and then tell them, here's the amount of money that you have to spend for your meal today or when we go on our trip. And um, that was the goal of our trip was to go up there, sit in a restaurant and order a meal and uh, each of them would pay for it. <clears throat> but with that came the lesson of how do you sit at a, a table? What are your manners? Um, how do you order food to stay within a budget um, and also have money to pay a tip? And so each of those students um, took those lessons very seriously and learned how to read the menu. They ordered and were polite in that. And then they even made sure that they left a tip for the waitress. Um, and you know we were able to do that at one restaurant. And I know that that can't happen right now, but those are things, different um, things that can happen with students and teaching them how to um, take care of their food you know, uh, there's a big movement about food sovereignty um, right now. So teaching them about that, what are what are good foods for us and what aren't good foods. Um, <clears throat> a one story that Chris told about when he took students to a restaurant and on his trips, <clears throat> one of the students didn't want to go to a restaurant. And so Chris asked him why. And he said, because they ask too many questions. You know, they ask you what you want to eat, how do you want your food, what do you want to drink, but that's that's part of having conversations, um, building vocabulary. We and again, we don't think about them as um, ways to uh, teaching children something. We just because they're everyday activities, we don't think about it. But those are things. These children learn from you how to be able to interact in a public setting or to interact at home or to interact in a school setting. There was a principal I knew that said, um, children have school behavior, they have home behavior and they have behavior for going to town. So we wanna be able to establish for these children what our expectations for them are when they come into school. So those the children can learn those things. And it's what your expectations are of your children so that they will know how what's expected of them depending on the situation that they're in. They learn that by watching you as an adult or their family around them. They learn about how to interact with the world. So, and the world is really full of art when you think about it and look at what's going on around you, that's what's there. Um, so anyway, anything else? I have a question, Mr. and Mrs. Bordeaux, and it's connected to this, like behaviors, right, and expectations. And, and you know, questions were asked about test scores. And you know, I know that you know that in teacher training, so much of the emphasis is about managing your, your classroom, and that's managing young people. Um, and that there's something like fundamentally disrespectful about approaching the space that you share with young people as a as a like in a management role of behaviors consistently. Can you speak to the relationship between what you've named as like following the interests of young people, following the lead of young people, letting them share with you the things that they're interested about, and incorporating arts consistently um, into classroom or education spaces and what that does with the with these so-called behaviors right and that that are always referred to in classroom management um conversations there's a relationship right like a clear relationship that those behaviors don't even seem to seem to show up when young people are seen and heard and respected in, in educational settings, in ways that they're not in col colonial education systems? Well, I always believe that children deserve respect no matter what. 
and um, no matter what age and no matter what their behavior is. And in my experience, if you take the time to listen to children, they will be, they will tell you a lot. Um, and if you're not listening, then they will express themselves and they express it in many different ways. And sometimes it explodes out of them and sometimes it causes them to shut down. Um, but <clears throat> I've encountered a lot of teachers in my uh, time in teaching that um, they want children to respect them first rather than taking the time to respect children. But Nanette comes back to that statement I said earlier about having a relationship with children is that um, we need to be able to talk with them and hear what they're saying. And it takes a lot of patience. And um, but at the same time, it's important to be firm. You're not their friend. Um, as the adult, you're the boss. That's the easiest way for me to explain it for adults to understand. But you, as being the boss, you're not there to boss them around, but to let them know, here's, here's what my expectations are. And it's not about setting limits, it's about saying, this is, uh, I guess the way my mom explained it, you give them a choice. Um, you want them to put their shoes and their socks on so that you tell them, you have a choice. You could put on blue socks or you could put on red socks, but you need to put on socks and then you need to put on your shoes. So even if they choose to put on one red sock and one blue sock, that's okay that they're putting on socks and then they're putting their shoes on. So you've, you've established what your expectations are and it's not a battle and you're not demanding, you're just stating. You know, it's really hard for people to understand that because every, all of our, be, any behavior we have, we've learned, we've either learned it from our family and our home or we've learned it from interacting in a school system. And a school system tends to be from a deficit model where they look at everything is wrong and they don't give, an, uh, give children an opportunity to show um, that they can do these things. So it's, that's how I see it. Um, you know, and you just have to be able to state that in a manner that the child understands. And, you know, one of the activities that um, in my classroom that when I worked with special ed and uh, other person that was in a classroom with me, what we would do is we would have a time in the morning where we would sit and talk because I wanted to build vocabulary skills of the special ed students there. And so um, we would sit and visit about, well, here's what we did over the weekend, or here's what I did last evening, here's how we did this, and just talk and visit and building that and giving the students the opportunity to be part of our conversation. But in that we established, here's what our expectations are when we sat in, in a circle and um, encouraged the students to give us their input too. So we recognized and respected what they had to say. That's what's really hard for adults to do is to um, give children that opportunity to express themselves. Chris, do you have anything you want to add to that? I think, uh, what was the question? <laughs> um, it's about classroom management. Yeah, I know, just, um, I think what classroom management about is, is control. And I always try to get, you know, like Debbie said, what they did was just sit and visit with them or let them visit. And I always try to do that, you know, whether I was uh, teaching, whether I was in a gifted room, 
gifted classroom or a regular classroom, it, it didn't make any difference to me. It was in a, it was a classroom as a box. And to make them feel comfortable there to uh, just visit. And that really made a difference. Um, when our grandson was staying with us and they started having virtual class, I, I was watching a couple of them just to see what what was going on and uh, being in a monastery, you know, they're very, uh, it's Montessori. And the, what I saw was the teacher was still trying to be in control. And being in control, you can't really, you can't, it's impossible to do virtually. And what I was listening to was all of these children who hadn't seen each other for a while, were all wanting to tell them what was going on. So after I think that when the third time they had class, the first thing she did was say, um, you know, tell us about what you did. And the children just by themselves start taking turns and telling about what, they, what they've been doing, what's going on. And it, it took about 10 minutes, you know, I mean, that's not a lot of time. Um, and it relaxed the children. And then she got in there and started, the teacher got in there and started talking and then incorporated everything that they were talking about into the lesson. So it's just giving those children that opportunity to, to be comfortable with where they're at, you know, what uh, the classroom they're in. Because um, when you walk in a classroom of a school, that classroom belongs to that teacher. But when you get on a virtual, that classroom belongs to those students. And it always should be those classrooms should belong to those students. And, and you, I mean, that to me, that's a, that should be, that should be what teaching is about. And that's what I learned when I became a teacher was I learned a lot and had just tons of training about classroom management. And I didn't see any sense to it because the classroom management is to control the teachers. I taught a class at this one school on classroom management and all of those teachers could recite what they learned about classroom management and they, they said we know about it we did this and we do this and i said do you still have discipline problems do you still have and they all got real quiet and they said yeah so i said so what is that is that training working and and the, one of them said i guess not so it's you can't control those children there's no way to control. And if you control them, they won't become any adults that uh, they will, to me, they'll try to be con controlling or they'll always listen to people they shouldn't listen to. And it's just, and I always say in schools, there's these group of children who no matter what you throw at them, they'll make it through the year. They'll make it through the school. And people start looking at them as the success of the school and they look at the children who are struggling and they just kind of push them aside. And it's those children, I think, who are, who need, or all of them need art. And when you get them in, and I don't remember ever having any problems with children in, in when they come, no matter what they did, because the gifted and talented is what, their gifts, what their talents were, and we just built on it. And I was ready to give up teaching after, I don't know, a few years till I found out what gifted and talented was about. And I thought, oh, that's that's what I've been doing and, and it doesn't, I don't fit. So I got into gifted and talented so I could do all of that stuff I do. And have to, con and I still don't think I convinced a lot of people I mean, teachers still came to me and said, all you ever do is have fun. Like, well, duh. 
learning is fun and but not there's no i don't think there's any buts i think you just have to do that there's no other way to say it you have to do art and how whatever art is to you that's what you do whatever these because when i did a lot of this stuff i would bring in a lot of native artists a lot of non-native artists and some of the children would come in and throw things around and say i don't know how to do this i say okay well just sit and sit and watch and you know and, and listen and then about five minutes into it they were the main ones in her trying you know getting paint all over and i had a painter come in one time and after a week our bathroom was covered in paint it was paint splattered all over the walls. And I tried to keep the administration out of the room, but I didn't make it. So I already got chewed out for, for the mess. And I never said it was a mess. And I said, well, we'll just clean it up and paint it over. And they went, oh, OK. So just, and we did a little art show. And everybody, would, and the whole school, the community, parents came in, grandparents aunts and uncles and we're just our son did this our daughter did this our takoshas did this you know and yeah so they encouraged them after that and lo and behold their test scores went up their grades went up but it's just people we've learned how to be look at everything that's bad about children. I mean, that's what I was taught. You walk in a classroom, you see how bad they are and you try to fix them. But I always walk in a room and see children and see how good they are and build on it. I don't know. That's what you have to do. Thank you so much. And thank you both for the firmness with which you responded, because there's this tendency in schools too to say different teachers have different styles. And if styles of teaching are harmful to young people, it's not acceptable. I appreciate the firmness. And I, uh, thank you to, to Dusty and to Michelle for your, uh, and Alyssa for your comments and Thank you all for being on this. I really enjoyed this. Looking forward to next week when I get to listen to Debbie. <laughs> Thank not you. That all. I don't, not that I don't listen to her all the time. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to share. Thank you so much. Can't wait to be with you both again next week. And hopefully you will be with us for the youth panel um, on the Tuesday following. That's really exciting also. And I know that you encourage those types of panels um, and feedback and critique from young people. I'm really looking forward to that. Um, if folks would like to unmute to clap or say, see you, la see you later, see you next week, that would be great. And we can we can close out. Thank you all. Thank you all so much. It was so great being here. Thank you. Thank you. Can't wait till next week. <laughs> Doksha. Thank you. Doksha. You're welcome. <laughs>